My name is John Isham. I'm a professor of economics and environmental studies at Middlebury College. In my new role as faculty director of the Middlebury Center for Social Entrepreneurship, I've been thinking a lot lately about the liberal arts tradition. In particular, I've been asking an important question. Is there a tension in the contemporary liberal arts, a kind of tug of war? You see, on the one hand, we want our students to slow down, to reflect, to engage great books and great ideas. In the United States, this kind of liberal education, education designed to distinguish you as liberated, as free from binding constraints, has gone on for almost four centuries now. The roots of this ideal are even older. They can be traced back to those who were liberated by their studies in ancient Greece, and then later among the Romans and into the medieval period. Middlebury is an ideal representative of today's liberal arts. Engagement with great books and great ideas can be found in every corner of our Vermont campus. In our philosophy classes, our classes on political theory, in our laboratories, and on our stages. If you attended a liberal arts college, I'm sure you have in your mind's eye the picture of a professor who personifies this ideal. For Middlebury alums of the last 40 years, that person is likely to be our distinguished colleague, Murray Dry the Charles A. Dana Professor of Political Science. For many, Professor Dry is the liberal arts. Picture him forcefully challenging a new classroom full of Middlebury sophomores to get to the heart of the platonic ideal. Picture those students struggling, huh? stumbling, <laughs> only to arrive by the end of their studies with their demanding professor to a fresh understanding, their own understanding, of platonic virtues. In so many ways, this is the liberal arts, as it has been and as it will be. And yet, there is another hand tugging away. In 2006, Middlebury's Board of Trustees approved a mission statement which concludes with this sentence, through the pursuit of knowledge unconstrained by national or disciplinary boundaries, students who come to Middlebury learn to engage the world. Not engage great books, not engage great ideas, engage the world. A cursory glance at mission statements of comparable schools yields much of the same. At Yale, students are called to lead and serve in every sphere of human activity. At Amherst, it's to engage the world around them. At Spelman, young women are called to commit to positive social change. And doesn't this make sense? After all, it's now the 21st century, and we couldn't be further in so many ways from the often inequitable conditions and outdated worldviews that launched and nurtured the liberal arts for centuries. This century has ushered in a celebration of diversity, all for the better. Furthermore, in this century, the world faces challenges on unprecedented scales. Global poverty, climate change, the denial of basic human rights to too many. And finally, today's students, thanks to social networking, the low cost of global travel, and many commonly held cultural norms, can truly be labeled as global of their own accord well before they end up at Middlebury, Williams, or another great liberal arts campus, they have learned to be unconstrained by age-old boundaries. All of this would seem to call for a new kind of liberal arts, one in which dusty old traditions fall away, making room for the kind of learning that John Dewey presciently called for more than a century ago. Hands-on learning, service learning, civic engagement. At Middlebury, as is true at so many other leading liberal arts schools, the contours of this kind of learning are by now very familiar. It's students in an economics class doing a cost-benefit analysis of a proposed local energy project.
students in an education studies course, tutoring young grade schoolers. Students in an environmental studies seminar, helping to research and write state legislation. And even students designing and building an award-winning solar home. Jeff Freeman, a political science professor at Transylvania University and a celebrated scholar of the history of liberal education, points to such experiences when he proclaims that the liberal arts has become what John Dewey envisioned, based less on classical ideas and ideals and more on the premise that what matters is what students learn by doing. And now along has come the newest manifestation of the Dewey tradition, social entrepreneurship. It's a deceptively simple idea. It's the kind of entrepreneurship that seeks to maximize social value, not just profits, and it's everywhere these days. Sparked in the 1970s by the imagination and vision of Bill Drayton, founder and CEO of Ashoka, and featured recently on the cover of Forbes magazine in the person of Jacqueline Novogratz, the founder and CEO of the Acumen Fund. Social entrepreneurship is spreading like wildfire throughout higher education. Oxford University got all of this started in 2003 with the founding of the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship. Choose almost any of the world's most storied universities these days, Harvard, Stanford, Princeton for starters, and you'll find a Center for Social Entrepreneurship or Social Enterprise teeming with students bent on making a difference in the world well before they finish their undergraduate education. These students are looking to design and build better schools in their native Nairobi, spread vaccination programs in South Asia, address poverty and injustice in places they care deeply about, such as West Virginia or Detroit. Professor Fryman is right. This is the triumph of John Dewey who famously wrote in his well-known My Pedagogic Creed, I believe that education is a process of living and not a preparation for future living. He also wrote that education is the fundamental method of social progress and reform. So yes, on campuses worldwide, thousands of students have been lit up with the call of affecting social change on a large scale right now. It is therefore tempting to abandon Plato in the great books, tempting to say that the tug of war is over, that hands-on learning is triumphant. It's tempting, but my students and I have concluded that it would be dead wrong. This past January, 12 students and I led a class called Social Entrepreneurship in the Liberal Arts. We studied the literature on social entrepreneurship, and we concluded that the key to leading the kind of life that 21st century students aspire to, a life of meaning in the service of others, is not tied to technical skills, say accounting skills or project management skills. Those are important, but it turns out they're secondary. What's primary is to take on qualities that can best be called humanistic, to be able to listen, to empathize, to act with deliberateness and grace, to engage. And to do this well, my students and I have concluded, is to return to a question that has for millennia been at the very heart of the liberal arts experience. The question is, what is living for? Indeed, the aha moment that we had in my class was to realize that this question is also at the very heart of the entrepreneurial experience. In David Bornstein and Susan Davis's excellent primer titled Social Entrepreneurship, What Everyone Needs to Know, the authors quote Andrew Carnegie, who wrote that entrepreneurs must be willing to endure the humbling eclipse of self that comes from profound learning from others. This is not just a prescription for entrepreneurs of all kinds. It is a prescription for a life filled with meaning, the kind of humanistic life that all liberal arts students should be reflecting on and aspiring to, a life of the mind, of the heart, and of the spirit.
In his essay, Only Connect, The Goals of a Liberal Arts Education, environmental historian William Cronin delineates 10 qualities that he admires in people who seem to embody the values of a liberal education. As I recite them to you, notice what jumps off the page. This could easily be a list of what makes the best social entrepreneurs. According to Cronin, these people listen and they hear. They read and they understand. They can talk with anyone. They can write clearly and persuasively and movingly. They can solve a wide variety of puzzles and problems. They respect rigor, not so much for its own sake, but as a way of seeking truth. They practice humility, tolerance, and self-criticism. They understand how to get things done in the world. They nurture and empower the people around them. And finally, they follow E.M. Forster's injunction from Howard's End. Only connect. This sounds exactly, doesn't it, like the characteristics of the best social entrepreneurs. So thanks to working with my students, I've concluded that what at first seems a tension, a tug of war between old school and 21st century school, is not that at all. If we get it right at Middlebury and at other liberal arts campuses around the world, we will teach our students that their passion to be agents of social change must include not only connecting, it must also include reflecting. Reflecting with the care and rigor and vision that has always characterized the best liberal arts experience. To embrace the rise of social entrepreneurship on the world's campuses is not to reject the traditions of the liberal arts. It is rather to reaffirm the importance of those traditions in this challenging new century.